Hey, everybody, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit. And with me today is Stelios Contagoulis from Trader Summit. And we have the one and only Mark Faber, <laughs> editor and publisher of the Gloom, <laughs> Boom, and Doom Report. Mark, I'm such a big fan, and I know Stelios is as well. We're so glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice of you to have me on your program. Well, we again, we are super happy to have you here. And, you know, this is a really interesting time, I think, for, for traders and the markets in general. And we'd love to get your opinions and your thoughts about certain things. And one of the, I mean, you know this better than anybody, one of the things that continues to drive up asset prices are the low rates that you're seeing, not only from the Federal Reserve, but every central bank around the globe. And it's, it's really suppressed volatility in, in, in currencies. We've seen an onslaught in, in, in demand in assets like cryptocurrencies. What are your thoughts about where central banks are at with rates so low? Are, are we following the same road or the same path that Japan has been in for so many years? What are your thoughts on where the central banks are at? Well, I think the Japanese situation is quite different than what we have uh, in the Western world. Because, yes, the Japanese bought assets. I mean, the Japanese central bank, uh, they bought assets and uh, supported the asset markets. Mm -hmm. But we have to see one thing. The Japanese had a trade and current account surplus. In other words, uh, their foreign debts are very low. They practically have no foreign debts. They can do the whole exercise domestically. Whereas in the case of the U.S., obviously, the country, uh, the country's economic policies have favored consumption and not capital investments. And therefore, uh, as the economy grows, the trade deficit and the current account deficit grows. So America is becoming more and more dependent on foreign <laughs> money. And therefore, their room to maneuver is more limited than is the case in Japan. But I think uh, at the moment, uh, and uh, don't misunderstand me, I don't have a very high opinion of the intellect of uh, federal uh, board members and their governors. I think there are people of academics that uh, are pretty much useless. You know, they are educated morons. Well, the, and now, and I, even I, to this, even to this, these people, it has to be striking that the most active stocks in the U.S. and the ones mm -hmm. that go up the most in one day are the meme stocks. You know, if this yeah. is what Money printing does, uh, namely to create a casino out of the basic function of a capital market is essentially to get investors' money that have savings into the hands of entrepreneurs who invest the money in hopefully a profitable way. But you understand, there's a macroeconomic function of the stock and the bond market, but it seems what the Fed has done is removed or uh, obliterated the economic function and introduced, I'm not saying a Las Vegas casino because the Las Vegas casinos are relatively profitable, but they've <laughs> introduced an Atlantic City third class uh, casino. You know, what I find fascinating, uh, speaking about central banks and central bankers, is that while they're in office, they always they all say the same things. And then when they're out of office, like, even you know, Bernanke, Greenspan, they change their tune, right? They talk about gold in a different way. They talk about debt in a different way. So it's it feels like they have to say what they say when they're in that position. And then when they're out, uh, obviously, they can change their tune. Well, is, to be fair to them, uh, they are liars, but not as bad liars as Mr. Fauci. He is still in the administration and he changes his view every day or says something every day. Whether he does it purposely 
or because of stupidity and viciousness, who knows? But it's uh, an amazing thing that, uh, but what you said is, yes, they have a uniform view. In other words, uh, recently, an economist, a lady, her name slips my mind right now, but she wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal and said, it's amazing that in the last, say, 10 years or so, not one of the voting members of the Fed ever dissented. They were all in agreement with the policies that the Fed took. This is uh, an amazing occurrence because I've been on board uh, of com boards of companies and occasionally there is somebody who dissents who has a different view. Yeah, absolutely. So with, yes. with but anyway, it's not worth to talk much about the Federal Reserve members because it's basically a waste of our intellect. <laughs> <laughs> so with now let me let me ask you this, Mark. It with with interest rates where they're at, we're seeing obviously inflationary pressures pick up. How, how, where do you where do you see inflation going near term and maybe over the next couple of years? Yes, this is, I mean, a question that everybody is uh, concerned about. But we have to look at how inflation occurs. It occurs because there are some shortages at the present time. And uh, then we have to think, well, how did these shortages come about? First of all, uh, it is clear that when the government intervenes into the marketplace, you get a lot of distortions, especially with monetary measures, because the money doesn't flow into the economy equally, as you know. And everybody has seen over the last 12, 18 months, the money has not flown to, flown to, to, to poor people. It's gone to the already richest 10 people in America. In other words, they benefited the most from money printing. And so the money, when this happens, sorry. Hello? No, we're here. Yes. Can you, can you here. see us? Oh, yes. You're here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I made a mistake with the computer. Anyway, when this money flows into the economy, it uh, usually in a speculative bubble like you create when you print money, mm -hmm. It neglects sectors that are out of favor. Recently, the money has flown is into SA, SPACs, mm -hmm. or it flows into meme stocks. But it didn't flow in the last few years into basic industries. So the capacity of basic industries was shrinking. And because of the subsidies that the government paid, after COVID-19 and the money printing subsidies in the form of fiscal deficits and the money printing, suddenly the demand was very strong. Mm -hmm. And so a strong demand combined with limited supplies and low inventories pushed up prices dramatically. But you see, my view is, I think this recovery is not sustainable. And we probably reached peak growth rates already. From here on, the economy will slow down. You know, there's employment gains and industrial production increases and so forth. We also have a slowdown in China that is very obvious and visible. Yeah. It's not the recession, but it's a slowdown. And so maybe we have in some sectors like, you know, one price that has gone through the roof is lumber. Another price are freight rates, you know, the Baltic dry index type of freight rates. And that may have reached peak momentum and may ease again. So on, on one of the very few occasions where I tend to agree with the Fed, I think the price increases at least the rate of price increases at the present time are transitory. They will not, the prices will not collapse because the Fed, if prices started to go down, they would print again money. 
And this I always say, you know, I'm just waiting for the day when they in intervene in the crypto market to support the crypto market. Right. And you, and you understand, once you support the markets, the bond market, and you intervene in the stock market to keep asset prices up, you intervene in the housing markets to keep prices up. Uh, when will you keep prices of cryptos up? Because cryptos are reached a value of roughly two trillion dollars, so it's a significant market. Yeah. It is, and so with so if, if I'm if I'm reading you correctly, that you you think that inflationary pressures are going to be transitory, but you do think that gr growth is going to slow down. But let, let me ask you this: with with um, with let's talk employment really quick. Since a lot of the United States, many states, at least here in the United States, and uh, Stelios happens to be in Greece, obviously different stories around the world, but in the United States, we are actually going to have some states come off of, uh, some people are not going to get the, the uh, unemployment benefits that they once have had. Is that going to force them back into the em employment picture? And how's that going to change from the U.S. and make it look like from an employment point of view? Yes, I think this is a very good question, but we just don't have the answer. Uh, what will, theoretically, what can happen? The government stops paying workers the supplements. So the workers are forced back into the workforce. They're forced to go and work because they don't get these benefits anymore. Now, the question is, to what extent will the migration back into the workforce substitute the decline in transfer payments from the government? Maybe the move back into the workforce will generate more incomes for people than what they get from the government. But I've seen statistics that showed on many occasions workers getting more from the government than they were earning before. Sure, so maybe yeah. income there's is no going There's out. no incentive. Yeah, so no incentive. we don't know for sure. And number two, I'd like to really emphasize this. And I think the people who say, well, we'll have a lot of inflation, they may overlook this factor. You have a salary and uh, maybe you were out of the workforce mm -hmm. for a while, but you go back now to the workforce or you get uh, the same compensation as before. But if in the meantime, your cost of living is up substantially, food cost, health care, insurance cost, educational costs for your children, whereby, you know, there's a big question whether education has any value in a society that becomes savages. <laughs> but this is, this is, these are issues that we don't know for sure. How much real money will people have? And so my suggestion is that if the cost of living uh, increases more, then the wages that is then the wages you obtain, your purchasing power will go down, and therefore the overall demand in the economic system will not take off. Yeah, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And it, so, but we don't know. We don't know for sure. But all I can tell you is, the bond market collapsed between August 2020 and say about four weeks ago. And I'm here describing the government bond market in the US. For the last four years, despite, I mean, relatively robust economic statistics that the US published, whether you believe them or not is a different matter, but Despite these relatively robust statistics, the bond market has actually acted quite well. 
and uh, is kind of showing a breakout on the upside at the present time for the 10 years treasury note and the 30 years. Now, this wouldn't happen, this upside breakout in bonds, if we were about to get very high inflation and a very strong economy. That's so a, that's you understand, we have mixed signals and to just sit, sit there and say, yeah, we'll have ha high inflation. Uh, we'll have to analyze this very carefully. Uh, the last few months hasn't been very good for stock prices, except as I mentioned, the meme stocks, but say, you look at Apple, Apple is no higher than at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, what was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is uh, something I've actually asked a couple of other people on, on other interviews. Um, quantitative easing, you know, uh, the Fed and the world embarked upon it on uh, after the global financial crisis. And there's, um, there's, there's a lot of people who, th who say that, look, this is a very inflationary um, thing for central banks to do because, you know, they flood the, uh, the system with, uh, with money, etc. And I, right. I have had this argument that I, th I believe that it's actually um, something that is deflationary because with all this QE and zero rates, you get risk assets going higher, you get uh, bonds going higher, you get house prices going higher, everything becomes more expensive. So at the end of the day, you get disposable income the, the disposable income of the average person becomes less and less because like you said, you know, education, healthcare costs, food, energy, housing, Absolutely. it all goes higher. And if you look at the um, average wages from 2008 to now in the US, I think it's just unchanged. Is that right? I think it's, it's right. So what, what's your view? <laughs> the purchasing power of the typical household just recently, again, there was in the Wall Street Journal an article on the subject the people at an age of 35 years, they earn less than their parents, the boomers, and they have less money. Because as you explained, a lot of things, homes are not affordable yes. for young people. And that's why I think we have to be careful in the uh, widespread view Inflation will accelerate. I think inflation probably has seen the trough. And I also feel that interest rates have seen a long-term low. Say if we take the last peak in interest rates, 1981, we've been in a bear market for interest rates. In other words, interest rates were falling, falling, falling until last year, August. And since then, I think we have a rising interest rate structure. But from time to time, we overdo it. So we fall in the bond market in the US, uh, yields say 1.7% on the 10 years. But in Europe, you have many bonds that have negative yields. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Even 10 year Greece is below 1%, which. Is incredible. <laughs> if only I had a way to short that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, whatever you think is a good short, be careful because you have the people that specialize in squeezing the shorts. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I used to be um, I used to be a market maker in London in uh, interest rate swaps and I've seen I traded through the global financial crisis and I've seen situations which were you know pretty uh, pretty difficult. Uh, I mean we we all have Yeah, but, yeah sure, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So Mark, uh, I, I I appreciate all your all your um, commentary on the bond market and rates and inflation. But I want to shift gears a little bit to cryptocurrencies because that's obviously been where the action's been at in the markets. Everybody's talking about crypto, and I, I, I'm sure you have an opinion about a cryptos. B have they, you know, taken the the mantle from gold and silver and other precious metals, or how's their relationship towards? Are, is it the same or is it even different? And what's your view on crypto, the cryptocurrency uh, market in general? Well, what you said is, of course, absolutely correct. And the Fed geniuses 
they never thought for a minute in the last 20 years that of all the money they print, most ends up in cryptocurrency speculation. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, <coughs> if cryptos had a, a real economic impact, I would say, okay, it, it helps the economy in one way or the other, but this is not yet the case. In fact, the energy consumption is so high that it's rather negative for the economy than positive. But anyway, it's interesting that you bring up the point that the money focuses on cryptocurrencies, which I agree. It focuses on GameStop, COS, AMC, and other speculative meme stocks in America, and on cryptos. Now, we have among cryptos, bitcoins. And bitcoins, as we all know, the supply is limited to around 22 million coins. And it won't go up. So uh, in the long run, I suppose that bitcoins should go up. Now, the question is, we may say the supply of bitcoin is, the total supply is, say, 22 million. So we have Picasso paintings. We know we have maybe 500 Picasso paintings in the world. I don't know whether more or less. But it's a constant figure uh, whereby there is some wear and tear because from time to time, one Picasso burns in a house fire or in a museum fire and so forth. But the supply is fixed. But what is not fixed is how many Roscos will come to the market and how many other painters will sell their wear in the marketplace. So in other words, it's like Bitcoin, the supply is limited, but the number of competing uh, cryptos is not limited. Yeah, there are 5,000, right? Assume, I assume, you know, we have USB ports, this is a standard worldwide. You can go to Japan, you can plug in a USB port, you can go to Latin America, America and Europe. That works. Also, most plugs, uh, they nowadays are quite standardized. Of course, the US has still a different system, but, <laughs> uh, but in general, it's standardized. And I think the standard of cryptos will be Bitcoin, could be. But we are not sure. We're not sure about that. It's, it's interesting, you know, being somebody like myself, and I'm, I'm sure I can speak for Stelios too, that we lived through the internet uh, boom and bust, if you will, in the 90s, early 2000s. You look at all, I, I, I try to see if I could draw a parallel between all of the internet companies, the dot-com companies that came and gone. And of course, there were ones that survived. We have our Amazons of the world. We have our AOLs of the world. But 95% of them have gone away. Just as Stelios mentioned, I think if the number is not, if the number is so, it's close to this, we have 5,500 altcoins now. How many of those are going to truly exist in the future, Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's like at the beginning of the 20th century, there were in America alone 250 car manufacturers. Wow. There's still more brands left, but there are three car manufacturers in America today. And Toyota at that time didn't exist, nor did Hyundai and so forth. Right. Nor did, nor did Samsung. So you understand this constant change. And uh, I think uh, the future is, of course, that we have a, a cryptocurrency technology. I think that I would go into a shop and open the wallet and pay with coins and with banknotes. I think this is antiquated. But exactly what will replace it and about the security of the replacement, we don't know. All I can say is the, the following. If you check out of a hotel 
and you have your credit card and you want to pay and the uh, computer system doesn't work in the hotel, you cannot check out. That's a good point. Maybe with yeah. cash, you can ask the cashier to maybe, you know, get the bill. But she says, I can't get the bill because the internet doesn't work. The computer system is down. So you, you understand? The problematic is in an emergency, in a complex society such as we have today. It's like when the food supplies into New York do not come in. Because in New York, there's no food. It all comes in. It's imported from other states of the US sure. and from other countries. But if that supply of food doesn't come in, society breaks down. You have massive looting, massive. Sure. But so you say uh, in, in an old society, you know, say 150 years ago, people lived in the, in the countryside on their farms. Then each farm has some water, each farm has some chicken and maybe some animals uh, and some, they plant some vegetables and maybe some wheat and so forth. So the self-sufficiency was much higher. Today, we have very complex society. If a ship breaks down in the Suez Canal, we have huge disruptions. Right, which we did. <laughs> yes. That, uh, I live in a small city, it's more like a village in the north of Thailand. Uh, one thing there will always be is plenty of food. Because it's a very rich agricultural uh, country here. And I have enough land to actually grow my food. I can also keep some cattle here and chicken and uh, sheep <laughs> and crocodiles. They all mix very well together. I don't know if I believe you about the crocodiles, but go ahead. <laughs> I keep them for the CIA intruders. <laughs> so awesome. Well, Mark, so I'm going to I'm going to give you the last word really quick. And I appreciate your thoughts on cryptos because, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of speculation here and and uh, and, and it, it's going to take some time to see what the fallout's going to be. Um, and, but as as we've all seen in recent weeks, um, th they are start, starting to show some signs of weakness. Uh, how long that's going to be and how much it's going to persist is, I guess, to be seen. But one thing that has stood the test of time has been gold and other precious metals. And we've seen this really nice surge in the new all-time highs in gold just this over the last couple of years. So what is your opinion about precious metals? Are they antiquated? Like, are they a paperweight, like a rock? Or are they gonna be worth something in the future? What say you? Well, first of all, this is a question you should also address to some women. <laughs> Whether it, it, a gold ring or a gold watch or a gold uh, necklace has uh, the function to be a paperweight or to improve their looks <laughs> <laughs> or impress other people. <laughs> Number two, throughout history, as we know, the supply has been, I say, relatively limited because, of course, the mines keep on producing, but it's not the supply doesn't grow as much as the supply of paper monies. Never. So I would say you should own some precious metals. You should own. And as I mentioned in my earlier uh, remarks, I think that the fact that speculation has moved to cryptos and to meme stocks and to all kinds of vehicles is very good because the speculation is not in the gold market. There's very little speculation in the gold market. And, and, and so when that gives oh, me I'm sorry. encouragement, that gives me encouragement to hold gold. But I would hold my gold regardless. If you came to me and said, look, the fundamentals are disastrous and so forth, I'd say, yeah, maybe you're right. 
but I don't need the money and I want to have a reserve. Uh, my reserves is like an insurance policy. Uh, not having an insurance policy and hoping that I can use the insurance policy. Like if you have a life insurance policy, you don't hope to die. <laughs> this is it's like holding gold. You're not ho hoping that the whole world and the whole system collapses. And besides the point, if the whole system collapses, the question will really be, uh, is gold desirable? It, because if the zombies come to your house, they'll take your gold away. <laughs> you understand? Right. And if everything collapses, the central banks will take your gold away from your safe deposit box. And uh, vicious BLM members will take any jewelry you may have on you. You understand? We have to see very clearly. If the system breaks, it's very difficult to find a hiding place. So you're telling us basically we should have gold and guns. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you know how to use a gun. But for me, a gun is yeah. useless because I may shoot myself in the foot. That's all right. You have alligators anyway, so you'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think perfect. you can live a lifestyle where you don't antagonize people too much. But I've seen mobs during my travels and so forth. When you have a mob, they don't know what they're doing. Believe me. It's like a group of fanatics. Mm. You know, sometimes you watch a soccer championship and then the fans, the fans go after each other. They lose their minds. It's like yeah. investors who are rational in small individual on an individual level. They become irrational in the group, in the mass. This is the psychology of the crowd is totally different. That's why you can have a leader like Hitler. He could move a whole country and not just the stupid people. He moved the intelligent people as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So, uh, that I, I would say when things go bad, I don't know where the hiding place is. And, uh, but, uh, Historically seen, if you can keep your gold, then gold is obviously a store of value in a ta very hard time, in uh, times of revolutions and in times of war. And by the way, stocks as well. You know, if you look at Germany in 1900 and uh, today, they went through two world wars. <laughs> two, not one, two. And they had a hyperinflation period. Paper money became worthless several times. The families that could keep their gold, they were okay. And the stockholders, you know, if you own Daimler at the beginning of the 20th century, if you own Bayer and so forth, all these companies have survived. Yeah. They had price fluctuations and in times of wars, maybe uh, your family was expropriated of some of your holdings. But after the war, the families were again recompensated. The only instance where the families went, never got their compensation was uh, when you had socialism and uh, communism. Like in China, the wealthy people in 1949, they lost everything. They didn't get anything back. The wealthy people in Eastern Europe, the aristocracy, the Tsar's family, the Tsar family, they had plenty of money everywhere, but all of them, they chopped off their heads. The communists and the socialists, financed by Jews, largely. Because the Jews had a grudge against, uh, understandably, against the Tsar, because under the Tsar system, uh, Jews were really treated as second-class citizens. They had to live in... Uh, essentially selected areas. Right. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's I, about... I would say let's be optimistic and uh, hope that the system doesn't collapse entirely. <laughs> and so I guess the, the word the word to the young ones would be. Uh, you should really still consider gold and not look at it as a paperweight anymore. <laughs> I think what you should consider is uh, doing a job that will always be required. Like in every village, there was a baker, a butcher. Someone needs to build the homes. So you have uh, uh, builders, home builders. You have electricians. You have carpenters. And uh, you have uh, sanitary uh, repairmen and so forth and so on. You understand? These manual jobs are very important. You have a car repairman. But in today's society, they portray people who haven't gone to university as idiots. And the academics at the Fed, they're treated like gods. <laughs> when the opposite is true, the fed people, you put them down in the jungle, you put them down in the desert, they wouldn't survive a day, not one day. That's, yeah. That's a true statement. That is a true yes. statement. And if they came with the academic papers to a tribe in uh, the jungle, in the Amazonas of Brazil or wherever it is, and they say, oh, I'm a professor, they would laugh at him and they would eat him. They would slaughter them, yeah. <laughs> they, they would grill them. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, Mark, I, I want to, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Your uh, your insights and your, your study of history is second to none. I really, I know myself I know. And, and all of our viewers love to, love to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you very much, my Mark. Pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. And we're going to, we're going to stay I'm, healthy. We will, we will, and you do the same. <laughs> and you viewers have to stay healthy. <laughs> yeah. We will, we encourage all that for all of our viewers, so. They have to stay financially healthy. That's right. Absolutely. And so that's why you okay, need to- Okay, great. I leave you now. All right, thank you, Mark. And that was Mark, bye the bye. editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Mark, thank you so much. You're My awesome. My pleasure, like always. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Next time I Thank wear you. a T-shirt. Yes, please. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank Thank you. you. bye, -bye.